friends, we are continuing a series called Standing Strong in a Wicked World. It's a study of the book of Daniel. Now, last week in chapter two, we saw Daniel elevated to a high position in the court of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, because he was given by the Lord a special ability, a gift to interpret dreams. And if you remember, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. It really troubled him. And he challenged all of his wisest men in the kingdom, including the astrologers and the enchanters and everyone else. Tell me what I dreamt and tell me what it meant. No one could do that, but Daniel could. By the power of God, he's able to interpret the dream and tell him what it meant. And it really kind of, you know, really surprised Nebuchadnezzar and impressed him. And now Daniel was elevated to a high position. But here was the dream. The dream was about this large statue and it had different types of precious metals that it was made of. The gold head and then it had a silver torso and, and bronze, you know, midsection and, and legs of iron and feet of clay and iron. And each material represented a different kingdom. The current one of Babylon, which was powerful in all the earth, gold and then other kingdoms, different kingdoms that succeeded Babylon. So that was the dream, and King Nebuchadnezzar received the dream and gave Daniel the reward of a high position. Now listen, in chapter three, it starts out in a peculiar way because Nebuchadnezzar reacts this way. He makes a giant statue all of gold. Now, I don't know why he made it all of gold. My opinion is probably He's, he had that dream, he heard the interpretation, and he figured, you know what, if I make a statue of entire gold, the biggest statue anybody's ever seen, maybe my king will last, my kingdom will last forever, I could defy the prophecy of Daniel. Who knows what he meant, he maybe wanted Babylon to prevail. Either way, that's how chapter three starts, but chapter three gets really good. I, I'll give you a foreshadow. The fiery furnace is in chapter three. So listen up, Daniel chapter three, Starting with verse 1, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide, and set it on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then he summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Okay, so this thing is 60 cubits high, 6 cubits wide. A cubit in those days was the measurement from an elbow to an index finger. So you can imagine this thing's probably about 90 feet tall and about 9 feet wide. It's a giant metal gold medal statue. All right, let's continue. Chapter 3, verse 4. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, Nations and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image, image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Verse 7, therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and people of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, may the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold that you have set up. Verse 13, verse 13, furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? All right. I just want to say this. Remember that this part of Daniel is written in Aramaic. 
Most, some of it's Hebrew, some of it's Aramaic. And the rest of the New Testament, I'm sorry, the Old Testament is Hebrew. Um, and I wonder if they had like a copy and paste because these lists of words like the harp, flute, lyre, zither, harp, drum, uh, all seem to be showing up in succession. However, that was the order. And now King Nebuchadnezzar gave them another chance. He said, you didn't do it then. You were able to do it now and you could save yourselves. Worship this idol. What do you think they did? Let's go to verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Wow. Verse 19, then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude towards them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. And the king's command was so urgent and the furnace was so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Verse 24. And then Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazing and asked his advisors, weren't there three men tied up and threw into the fire? And they replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a sons of God. Ha <laughs> ha, may the fourth be with you. There's four men in, the, in this, this fiery furnace. It's amazing. Apparently, they were able to see into it. Maybe they were in a high place. Maybe the, the top of the furnace was open, likely was. And he's looking down, and he sees four men. And not only are they there, but they're not being burned up. They're actually walking around without, the t without their being bound in hands and foot. So who was the mysterious fourth man in the furnace? Now, most Christians understand this person to be a pre-incarnate Christ. That's a, a, a Jesus' appearance before his birth. Some believe that the fourth person, fourth person is the angel of the Lord that also appeared in the fire. And a fire was the burning bush that Moses saw in Exodus 3, 2, there the angel of the Lord appeared in him, I'm sorry, appeared to him in flames of fire from within the bush. And Moses saw that the bush was not, was on fire, but it didn't burn up. So two choices, maybe there's others, but if it was Jesus, then this fourth man in the furnace, and this is kind of where I believe, is what you call a theophany or a Christophany. It's an appearance of Jesus or an appearance of God in the Bible. And why not? Why couldn't Jesus be there? With him, even before he took on flesh and dwelled with us in Bethlehem. So, Daniel 3, 26. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. And they saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair on their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Whoa, verse 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command, and we were willing to give up, they were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be burned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save this way. And then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. This is a very extreme man, Nebuchadnezzar. Very extreme. Obviously, his actions show this. And you'll see even in the next chapter, he gets even more extreme in his behavior. But this event is amazing. This is a Bible story that has inspired children and adults alike for thousands of years. These three brave men, they were so committed to honoring God that they defied the king's orders to worship this statue idol that he had set up, even if it meant suffering a horrendous death. In the end, not only were they 
miraculously rescued from the kingdom, but God also promoted Jadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to high positions, but also Nebuchadnezzar decreed that God is the Lord and no one should speak out against him. No one can dishonor the God of Israel. That's the result of all that took place, merely because these men were not willing to compromise, not willing to bow before this idol and worship another false god. Now, these, there's three things in this chapter I want to pull out, come away with, and pull out and take a look at before we, we close. There's three things that help us to learn from or be inspired or, or really allow God to reveal his ways to us as we attempt even in our present day, to stand strong in a wicked world. Remember, that's the name of our series, Standing standing Strong in a Wicked World. Obviously, they stood strong in a wicked world, and we can too. So these three things we learn from this chapter. Number one, they said, we will not serve your gods. We will not serve your gods. Verse 12, these, there are some from Jews from who you sit over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you and your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. In today's society, there's not necessarily statues of gold that people have to bow down and worship to. That doesn't necessarily, I'm sure somewhere in the world, take place, but it doesn't necessarily take place in our day and age and in the region that we live. But make no mistake, there is an increasing number of ideological gods, ideological gods that are being raised up that society expects to submit to, expects us to pay homage to. These are systems of ideology, values, ethics, perceptions of justice, perceptions of morals. These systems of ideology that are not based on the word of God, but based on human wisdom and secular philosophies. So standing strong in biblical values and Christian worldviews uh, on key issues, whatever they might be, it could be sanctity of life, it could be marriage and sexuality, it could be the exclusivity of Jesus. But when you stra- stand strong in these and don't bow to these ideological gods, you can evoke the wrath of society against you, sometimes even the government, in a similar way that Nebuchadnezzar's wrath burned, it says, against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. See, right now we're pressured, not necessarily forced, but we're pressured constantly to forsake honoring God in our lives, to bow to a secular worldview. And right now we're not forced, but that seems to be changing every year. It seems to be getting worse and worse. No one's forcing you right now, in some countries they are, but to forsake the things that you know as truth from the word of God or face persecution or ostracization or maybe even martyrdom. Um, We see it all around us. Christian principles, Christian values are not just being disagreed with, but are being attacked. Christian behaviors, and and maybe not necessarily religious behaviors, but behaviors that that pertain to our understanding of truth as we read the word of God are being attacked more and more in our society. So we need to be very careful how we live and act and speak, but we must carefully consider both Romans 13 and Acts 4, 9. Now, Romans 13 tells us, verse 1, let everyone be subject to governing authorities. But Acts 4, 19, actually, Peter and John give us an example, and they say, Peter and John answered and said, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, you judge. And they decided there's times where you don't listen to the authorities and don't do what they say, you listen to God and do what he says. There may come a point where you and I are ostracized or persecuted for honoring God and and obeying his word. And when that time comes, we need to know what we're going to do. We know what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did, but we need to know what we are going to do. Will we bow down and worship the ideological gods that are in our present day society, or will we be that remnant that will not bow our knee to false gods? In the time of Elijah, the whole country of of Israel was turning to idol worship, except for few. And in Romans, Paul talks about this, Romans 11, 2 through 5. And it says, do you not know what the scripture says about Elijah, how he appealed to God against Israel? Lord, they've killed your prophets and tore down your altars. 
I'm the only one left, and they're seeking my life as well. And what was the divine reply to him? I have reserved myself 7,000 men, reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. In the same way, at the present time, there's a remnant chosen by grace. There's a remnant of people that will not bow down, will not bow down to false gods. All right, that's number one. The second of the three that I don't want to come away with, he says, even if he does not, even if he does not, where is that? It's in, in verse 18. But even if he does not deliver us, save us from the furnace, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. You know, we're all tested from time to time regarding our faith and our trust and our obedience to God. And when things don't go our way, there's times when we ask for one thing and the opposite happens, or, or we believe God will respond to our prayers in a specific manner and a specific time, and then when it doesn't turn out that way, the way we had hoped, we lose our faith. Presumably, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego prayed, because they're praying people. We see it in other parts of the book. And I'm sure that they prayed that they would not be thrown into the fiery furnace. Who would want to be tied up and thrown in and burned alive? And they even said, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from us, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But their obedience and faith in God was not predicated on whether or not he delivered them in the way they hoped. They were willing to honor God even if he did not act in the manner and the time that they were praying for. And that's, that's the type of faith that God is looking for. That we don't value our, even our lives so much that we are willing to dishonor God. Do you remember Revelation when the believers were commended for overcoming the dragon who was Satan? Uh, Revelation 12, 11, it says, And they defeated him, dragon, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. This is clearly the posture of heart that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and as we see Daniel, they were in. They had that faith. They believed God. They would not dishonor God, even if he did not save them. How about us? Is our faith in God contingent upon him acting according to our will and obeying our personal wishes and about our desires? And what that type of attitude is backwards. It, it presumes that we are Lord and that God has to obey our will, not the other way around. God is the Lord, and we obey his will. God often enables things to happen and allows us to go through trials for reasons that are different than we hope or expect, sometimes higher than we understand. And we need to trust him, where he responds to our prayers, whether they're according to our plans or not. We need to trust him. And this is certainly the case with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which brings us to our final point, the final point. Number three, with us in the fire. He's with us in the fire. Verse 25, he, King looked and said, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. One of the most impactful parts of this whole story, this whole chapter, is not just that God rescued them and delivered them, but how he did it. How he did it. He didn't spare them by you know, simply changing the rules about the bowing down. It could have been that the king came and said, you know what, I've changed the rules. The king wouldn't do that, particularly this king. Or he didn't come, somehow get rescue them from the whole ordeal and sweep them away to some safe country somewhere else. No, no, no. He made them go through it. He made them go through it bound and tossed into the fire face to face with a torturous death. And then in the fire, he rescued them. In the fire, he unbound them. In the fire, he was with them. He walked through it with them. Whether it was an angel, as some people think, as, whether it was Jesus himself, a Christophany, as some of us think, he was with them in a fire, in the fire. And this is a very important lesson for us. Because we pray often that God would prevent hardships from happening, prevent difficulties. Yet he often allows us to walk through them, to go through them, even 
what are sometimes horrific, terrifying, and, and frightening ordeals. He goes through them with us. There have been many moments in my life where God has made me, enabled me, allowed me to go through very tough things. You know, tough times where it seems as though I could have said God's forsaken me or God has given up on me. But no, he always was with me. He's brought me through. He was with me in all of them. That's why I'm here today. <laughs> He's brought me safely through every single ordeal that I thought was the end of the road or I thought was so horrific, so terrifying, so awful that I could not make it through, yet I did. How? Because God walked me through it. Now, was I brokenhearted at times? Yes. Was I afflicted? Absolutely. But the Lord was with me and delivered me through all of those situations. King David writes in Psalm 34, 18 and 19, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted. He saves the contrite in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him from them all. King David knows what it's like to go through afflictions. He was in a tough spot right there in Psalm 34. Tough spot. He knows the heart of the shepherd. That's why he was able to write 23rd Psalm about the good shepherd. And in it, verse 4, Psalm 23, 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me with me. We may never get thrown into a fiery furnace. I hope you don't. But many of us have walked through the valley of the shadow of death, walked through things that feel or felt like the valley of the shadow of death. Things like health scares, things like relational heartbreak, divorce, financial crisis, death of loved ones. And I'll tell you that there's nothing that you can experience that the Lord won't be with you and guide you through with you as you walk through it. His desire is to be with you in all things. That's what he desires, is to be with us. You know, before he was even born, the prophecy about him from Isaiah 7, it said this, he will be, his name will be called Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? You know what it means, God with us. In fact, the very last verse in, in Matthew, Matthew 28, after the Great Commission, it's in some cases, the, maybe people believe this is the final words, at least they are in the gospel. And Matthew 28, 20 says this, Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. God is with us. So never believe the lie that God is forsaking you or that you're forced to go through struggles and challenges all by yourself, alone. He is with you in all things, even the toughest trials, even the most difficult situations. And his desire is be, to be with you through the fires and afflictions that you face throughout your, throughout your life. No matter what you face, fires, afflictions, troubles, situations, hardships, sickness, he is with you and he will deliver you out of them all. Remember that God is with you. Remember that he's near to the brokenhearted. And remember, you can always call to him in prayer. If you feel alone, don't believe it. He is with you through anything you face.